All right, you're in for a treat, friends. Mike Farrell Sports Show, episode number I don't even know anymore. Who cares? Uh, my name's Adam, and uh, Mike Farrell, as I mentioned earlier, is with me. Mike, um, I will, I'll let everybody in on a little secret. We, we hit the record button, and about 17 seconds beforehand, Mike says, I'm in a really bad mood. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what you're going to get here tonight. We got a lot of topics to discuss, but Mike, what's... Uh, What's got you in a foul mood, my friend? Well, first of all, I, I will tell you this. I just texted my former neighbor because I moved a couple months ago and something was shipped to my old house. And so I just texted him. He was reaching out to those people and saying, do you have this package? So I texted him. Guess what he did? He called. Uh, okay. I hate that. Yeah. If I want to call you, I would have called you. Yeah. It's right on. 2022. And that's all he does all the time, you know? Because he's in his truck or whatever, and it just pisses me off. So that pissed me off because what ha- that happens, I'm using my dumb phone because I can't make a decision on whether to buy a desktop because my desktop's from 2016 or a laptop and do a port. I can't make that decision, and I've been paralyzed by indecision for the last month. Um, mm. So I'm sitting here with my dumb phone, uh, and any time a phone call comes through, I go, the, the screen goes black. And I get these roto callers and these telemarketers, and they'll call from one number. I'll block it. They'll come up another number. It's just never ending. And You're I have Robo guy. Killer. I have Robo Killer, which you know determines whether they're scam or not. But Robo Killer is almost as annoying as the phone call itself, because when it rings, then Robo Killer picks it up and makes more noise than the phone call would. Um, and they're supposed to stop scammers and supposed to stop spamming and all that stuff, but you can't because the numbers will just crop up from a different number. Um, did you get your package? <laughs> that's let's, let's circle no, back there. No. no. So here's the oh, problem. Man. It's it's, and I'm waiting for these guys to sponsor me, but I'm, it's bang energy drink. And, and one of the okay. funniest things someone ever told me was when I'm drinking this stuff on the air, they, they said, I look like a 40 year old hairdresser and apparently hairdressers drink a lot of energy drinks. I didn't know that. Um, I so I that. asked, I asked actually this, this woman that I know is a hairdresser. And I said, do you drink this stuff? She's like, no. So it's a stereotype. But mm. that's my ultra COQ10 amino. I had four cases of this stuff. What flavor delivered? Were there? Uh, this is wild and wilder melon. Okay. Delivered to where I used to live by accident because I'm an idiot. So the vitamin shop has these on sale. I ordered yeah. them. They shipped them. FedEx. The the package was accepted by these people who bought my freaking house, and they just kept it. So I'm trying to send my neighbor over there to get it. He's like, I don't want to go over there. They're very chatty. You know, mm. they're, they want to talk about this, that, and the other. I go, just go over there and get it. And then I texted him. I said, have you heard back from them? And then he called me. Mm. So there's a myriad of problems. But the thing that's frustrating me the most is that college football season starting, which I'm excited about. Yeah. There were 80,000 preseason lists and content I wanted to do. And, and it's going to be done a week from Saturday. And I'm not going to be able to get to nearly half of what I wanted to do because I can't because I'm constantly being bothered or trying to build a business or trying to negotiate deals with this, that, and the other. Um, And that's frustrating me. And my ADHD sucks too. So, um, but let's talk Malachi Nelson, I guess. That's not even the tip of the iceberg. I mean, maybe you should have another one of those energy drinks. (laughs) Maybe you haven't had enough, you know? Maybe there's a counter effect you need to work on there. I'm just, there's so many things pissing me off today. Um, And it's a nice day. Okay. Okay. Whatever. Well, let's let yeah, let's start with Malachi Nelson. So news today, uh, he signs with Clutch. That is the agency that is fronted by LeBron James and his longtime yep. agent Rich Paul. Obviously, mm-hmm. well known in the NBA circle, have, have been sort of branching into other sports. I know they're in the NFL now as well, Mike. And uh, Malachi Nelson is now Clutch. Uh, yeah. Big deal. Little deal. No deal. Who cares? Big deal. Where are we? Big, Big deal. deal. Okay. I, w- I was told about this. Um, you know, after his this has been in the works for a while. Uh, and I was sworn to secrecy and I, I, I held my end of the bargain. I didn't know it was going to come you sure out. sure did. Wow. Well, I didn't know it was coming out today. I mean, it would have been nice. <laughs> I was told about it and told to keep it quiet. And the assumption I have was that I get a heads up when it happened <laughs> so that I could maybe like break it. But I've given up on breaking news because I just don't, I don't, I don't have that persistence of, Hey, is it happening? Hey, is it happening? When's it going to happen? Is it going to happen? So I'm more of a reactor to news. In fact, I talked to a company the other day and they said, well, the, the only real freelance openings we have are breaking news desk. I said, Nope, thank you. 
not interested. Not mm-hmm. going to do that because I'm not one of those guys that's going to be sitting there on call anymore. I was that way for 25 years. When a kid committed at 11, 12 p.m., I would write up an article or 6 a.m. Not not going to do that anymore. Too old, too cranky. Um, so this one I could have broken, but I didn't. Uh, it's been in the works. Uh, my first guest was Steinberg, who, you know, he signed Rattler and some others last year. But but Clutch, big deal. I mean, Malachi Nelson is my number one player. Uh, I'm coming out with those rankings. That's another thing that's kind of cranky is that it's not an issue of content. I can write the content. But now in this world of social media, you have to have graphics with everything. And I've got some great graphics people that work with me, but they're interns and they're not paid. So I can't demand things. I work on their schedule because I'm building a a business and rebranding and all this other stuff. So I could bang out these rankings in a second, but I got to get the graphics built and all this other stuff. So he's my number one player. Um, It's a big deal, you know, because it's it's a foray into not only college football but high school football for clutch um and that's as big a, an agency signing as you could have i think out of high school even steinberg when spencer you know spencer rather signed when nil started um he was a college student this is a high school football player signing with a massive agency led by the you know most well-known athlete in the world and I think it's a, a big, big deal. Well, does it say anything about, I mean, we've heard the Texas A&M rumors. Obviously, LeBron Clutch are uh, headquartered, I think, out of L.A. or have a pretty big L.A. presence. Is this, does it, is this instructive at all into where Malachi is leaning or is he staying committed? Are there, are there changes here? Do you think this decision impacts anything to do with that? I, you know, I mean, it's certainly it's L.A. based. Um but when, when I was told about this, it was coming off its Texas A&M visit, which he loved and had a great time on and, and was really interested in it. So my feeling is this helps USC. My feeling also when he visited Texas A&M, at first I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a business trip, but it was more of a, you know, let's keep this class together. But when I found out he was going solo and how much he liked it and how interested he was in them, um, I felt USC would have to sort of re-recruit him on the back end. I believe they've done that. He's kept kind of quiet since that Texas A&M visit. Uh, and I think this bodes very, very well for USC. Um, you know, Texas A&M still a threat. He could take visits to other schools, but right now I feel, you know, he's followed Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma to USC. Now he's got, you know, LeBron's agency based out of LA. I mean, every sign from 10,000 feet view is pointing towards USC. There's nothing pointing towards a and Well, then there's this. Uh, you and I were talking about this off air, so I can I can I found it for you. Uh, it is a tweet by former Oregon quarterback Achilles Smith. I don't know what uh, what credibility he has in this space, Mike, but he tweeted yesterday. It's being reported Malachi Nelson has been offered fifteen million dollars from Texas A and M. Hashtag Wow. Hashtag Salute. Hashtag huh. Nike, which is funny because Texas A&M is not a Nike school. But either way, uh, Achilles Smith, $15 million, he's saying, is being reported. Mm-hmm. Uh, I assume you want to debunk that quickly, yes? Yeah. He is, uh, and, and, you know, sorry about that. Uh, if you heard my throat, that was bang energy. There's good and bad to bang. Uh, the good part <laughs> is uh, it gives T- you It energy. tastes like paint thinner? Yes. <laughs> no, it tastes very good. The problem is you make these odd, weird noises from your throat. Um, which is, I think, pre, what's the word? What's the better word for uh, belching? Belching? Refunding? (laughs) So whatever that possessed noise you just heard out of my throat is because of the bang. So I apologize for that. Um, Very unprofessional. Achilles Smith has no credibility whatsoever in this space. I, I don't know. I mean, he's a, you know, former player. Um, that's, that's a fact, you know, I mean, he was a first round boss. Can't he's confirm. A, Both of those are true. I, 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 he's a businessman. I don't know what the hell he's doing now. Um, I, I'm looking him up on, uh, on, on Wikipedia and other stuff and trying to see what the hell he does now. Um, he's got a suit on 
but that that gives him no credibility whatsoever. This is just a rumor. He's going to make money. Okay, he's definitely going to make money. And and every time there was you know oh the 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 Tennessee kid you know Nico got eight million dollars, and then you know Rashada the Miami kid got eight point or nine point five million dollars. So now they're just looking at at, at Malachi Nelson just making up thirteen million dollars. No, this isn't happening. Everybody, stop. Okay, I know for a fact that this isn't happening. If you dig into these rumors, the 8 million, the 9.5 million, now this 13 million, they aren't there. These kids are gonna make money, okay? But there's no like deal on the table for him to go to Texas A&M for $13 million. It's not happening. Um, and, and it's honestly irresponsible. And it's really confusing to me because some of it comes from credible journalists who I've known for a very long time, who run with it. You know, the, the whole agent, of J of, of uh, Rashada, yeah. you know, he came out and said this, that, and the other, and Florida offered us this much. And, you know, it, it was more than what we took for Miami. And then a day later, he backed off of it because he's a, he's a big mouth and was lying. Um, but okay. they took it as fact. So now people are going to take this Achilles Smith thing and they're going to run with it as fact. It's not fact. I will dig into it. I will make some phone calls, but I can tell you right now, before I even make those phone calls, I know how much Malachi Nelson's worth right now, not committed to any school or not signed with any school. He's, he's committed to USC. Uh, it's not $13 million. Will it be? Yes. But you know, you're talking about numbers right now that are higher than Trevor Lawrence's salary. Yeah. That's not happening. Well, to be fair, Achilles Smith said 15 million, not 13 million. So you oh, shortchanged him a couple of mil no. there. Well, let's get back to clutch though. So, Explain this to me like I'm a kinder, kindergartner. Why is this a big deal? Why is Malachi signing with an agency? Why is that a big deal? What does that really mean for both Malachi and then for whatever his perspective school might be? Well, the funny thing about it is it's a big deal because no one can ever do it before. You know, it, okay, it's sure. kind of it's kind of dumb to say, um, but you know, um, it, it's just it's 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 a new world that we're in now that the kids can sign with agents. You know, we've had this sort of deal in baseball and hockey when you could draft kids out of high school or college and they had advisors, you know, um, but you, you, you didn't really have it. Well, you had it in the NBA for a little bit when they could come out of high school. You never really had this in football. Um, they would always have to put their three years in. They would have to wait to hire an agent. If they did hire an agent, they were gone. You know, the whole, um, what was it, Des Bryant thing. You know, years and years ago, lost a year of eligibility because of stuff like this. Um, you know, he 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 has agreements. Okay, he has agreements in place with companies. None of them are done by USC, but this this is going to enhance and increase that ability to strike these deals. So now you can say, okay, Malachi Nelson probably has been working with clutch for much longer than today. Um, but now you can say that he's officially got an agent. He can now strike deals and he can, his, his agencies can strike deals with boosters, um, not to lure him to a particular school, but now he could start to strike deals with companies, whether it's, you know, Caleb Williams, we saw with beats or, you know, maybe some, you know, massive conglomerate, uh, energy company in Texas or whatever, he could start to strike these now. Um, and I think that's important because now it's on. How does it, what does it mean for him? It means that we got to watch what deals are announced for Malachi Nelson and where they come from. Because if his first deal announced is, you know, out of LA, we know he's going to USC. So it kind of like points you in the right direction as to where he's going to go. And, and that makes it a big deal. And it makes it a big deal because now he can monetize his name, image, and likeness as a high school football player. And that's still not legal in some states, um, but it is in California. Um, and I just think it's a shift. Now, do people think it's good? No, but I dare you. I dare anybody, dare you to argue against these players and kids getting paid. You cannot. It is impossible. There is no argument against it. They don't, you know, free education. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. You know, schools, the TV deal, it's $7 billion that the big 10 is going to make up TV. Yep. 
right? So the CJ Strouds of the world should be getting a ton of money and they're finally getting it. And, you know, am I happy about it? I couldn't care less. Is it different than what we're used to? Yeah. And, and, and I don't like different. Nobody likes different. But there is no way that you could ever logically argue against a kid like Malachi Nelson making money. And that's why people said, oh, the A&M thing going to buy him. This kid, if he, if, he, <laughs> if he went to a JUCO next year, okay, let's say he said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to junior college. He's worth, you know, at least a million dollars, at least. And that's not even going to a college. So this isn't about more money at Texas A&M than USC. This is about where he's going to be developed as a NFL football player um, and also be able to monetize himself to the best of his ability. But let's throw out these numbers. Let's say 15 million to Texas A&M, which is a joke. He's going to make 15 million at USC, which is a joke. Um, it, it, there's no difference. He's just got to pick the right school for him and the right relationship for him. And, and it's up to clutch to make him the money and they will. Well, let me ask a question. This is maybe old guy, get off my lawn question. Right. But I feel like, you know, we're talking about big figures, right? We're talking about Malachi essentially being touched by the hand of LeBron, which in the sports scene is, is, a, is a pretty big deal. There's a ton of pressure on this kid now, right? I mean, like the the, the bullseye is square on on his chest. I mean, this is almost more pressure than any any college player's face coming in, right? I mean, I feel like the more these deals ratchet up, the more these kids are really putting themselves in pressure pressure cooker situations. Do you have any concern about that at all? Like, that guy's walking into a pretty pressurized deal nowadays. It's going to ruin kids, absolutely. I'm not saying it's going to ruin Malachi Nelson. I mean, everything I know about him, he's a pretty sure, down earth guy. You know, but it ruined kids last year. When then yeah. NIL started, you know, you don't, if, you, if people don't think that these deals that were signed affected DJ Wongalele, you know, Dr. Pepper or, or Spencer Rattler, you know, with, with uh, whoever he signed with, you know, Lee Steinberg and, and some, um, you know, uh, I don't know which, I don't know which memorabilia company, whatever, millions yeah. of dollars, Sam Howell. If you don't think that it affected their performances, if you think that last year was just a blip for the first time in our lives, we saw the preseason number one player in the country, uh, the preseason Heisman favorite, you know, bust out, get benched and have to transfer, you know, and, and, and if it wasn't Rattler, everybody said Howell was the number one pick and he regressed. Mm-hmm. And, and, and everybody saw the two games that DJ played at Clemson before last season. And then what, what, he, what we saw on the field last season, if you don't think that the money's affecting these kids, and I'm not saying they're working any less harder. Uh, I'm not saying that they're doing less film study or anything like that, but there are taxes and demands upon them and a guarantee of money that can dip into that hunger level slightly. And if you dip into that hunger level slightly, it's going to exponentially change some kids' trajectory to success. Uh, there's always been pressure. I mean, Trevor Lawrence had a ton of pressure. Number one player in the country, best quarterback I've ever seen. All these accolades thrown at him. And he went and won a national championship as a freshman. Okay. And he had a great career, ended up being the number one pick. But throw in money, it's added pressure. And I'm not saying Trevor would fold or anything, but kids are going to fold. I mean, Malachi Nelson said uh, a couple months ago, he bought himself a, a brand new Mercedes Coupe. Uh, he brought his he bought his mother a, a, a dream Louis Vuitton purse. Um, these are small little things that you just have never had to deal with before, um, and it takes away from your ability to be a great football player. And I don't know if he's going to be great or not. I know he's got the talent to be great, but yeah, kids are going to bust out because of this money. It's going to get worse, not better. How do we stop it? Is there is there a control mechanism? Is is that coming anytime soon, or are we just in the wild wild west until further well, notice? Until the government steps in. I mean, because this is just now. If you want to stop it, you're going to get um, lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit because you know the genie's out of the bottle. So until NIL is regulated on a on a government level, it's not going to stop, and it and it's not going to be one of those things where somebody you know doesn't pay their taxes. And, 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 you know, goes bankrupt as a 20 year old uh, college football player. That's not going to be a lesson that's taught. You know, people are going to say that, oh, that guy's dumb. 
I'm not dumb. Um, and it's not going to be a situation where boosters back off. There was a slight regression in the market last year when there were such failures like Rattler mm -hmm. and, and DJ. Um, there was a slight regression. That regression is gone. Um, and I think we're back to the wild, wild west again. I think we're starting to see when when we saw last summer, when, when NIL opened up, <clears throat> there were a whole lot of offers and deals out there that weren't well thought out um, and were very, very lucrative um, and they didn't pan out. We're going to make that mistake. Businesses are going to make that mistake again this year. Um, and, and that's going to be unfortunate, but I don't care. They're millionaires. Uh, the kids will benefit from it. But until the government steps in, there's no way to regulate this. Speaking of money, uh, the Big Ten got a boatload of it today, Mike. A new TV deal announced for the Big Ten, $7 billion. Let me repeat that in case anyone thought I stuttered. $7 billion spread across a bunch of different networks, NBC, CBS, Fox, FS1, and throw a little peacock in there just for fun, Mike. Uh, the Big Ten cashed in, notably ESPN not yet involved. I guess there's some thinking that maybe they could still get involved in a, in a package, Mike. But uh, Big Ten shuts out ESPN, goes pretty much everywhere else, gets $7 billion. Your assessment of that deal is what? It's great. It's just It's great. good, yeah. We should get $7 billion. Well, it, I mean, listen, you know, just on a small level, some schools in the Big Ten are doubling their annual media revenue, doubling. Yeah. And, and you have to understand where this has come from. You know, we've seen now roughly a 25 to 30% inflation in media rights in two years. And, and remember two years ago, we were worried about the future of college football. You know, COVID, we're gonna cancel a season. Uh, Kevin Warren couldn't go from a bigger joke to a bigger superhero in two years if he tried. And so what this is gonna do is it's gonna make the SEC's deal, which I believe is gonna be negotiated next year, even bigger, it's gonna be better. Um, it's gonna open up uh, additional days of football. So you're gonna see Wednesday nights um, and, and not just Maction or whatever, you're gonna see real big games on Wednesday nights. You're gonna see good games, but you don't want Friday nights. You know, they just still don't wanna compare, compete with the NFL. So sure. you're not going to really see head to head with, with with Monday night football or with Sunday or even Thursday night football. You might see a comp competition with Thursday night football because in general, the Thursday night football games have been just crap teams and the NFL will have to step up their, uh, you know, matchups for Thursday night because of that. Well, they, and they will. They're going to Amazon this year. So I think they need to put a good product yes. out at least year one. You didn't sign Al Michaels to call, you know, Colts and Jaguars every Thursday no. night. No, no. Uh, well, and, and the NFL is very complacent in what they do. I mean, they're very arrogant. So they feel they can do that. But they're going to have to compete with other viewers now, you know, and, and, and people, uh, other, other products that viewers are going to consume. And that's going to raise the level for everybody. Now we're going to see good football games you know, almost every day of the week, eventually, over the next couple of years, that's going to happen. Um, and you're going to see uh, athletic programs get a big boost uh, in revenue. Uh, it's going to help everybody. It's going to help everybody from, you know, Title IX all the way up to, you know, Power Five uh, National Championship football. Um, the, the thing it won't help, I mean, obviously expansion is going to continue. I mean, this deal itself reeks of expansion. It just screams of expansion. How so? <laughs> well, there's so many little, there's so many little caveats in here. You know, if this happens, then this happens. And, and all of these, if this happens are expansion. You know, we saw USC and UCLA jump on board. Now the big 10 is not in a hurry to expand, but the, in this TV deal, um, which dwarfs the old deal. Uh, there's there's language in there that speaks to expansion over the next seven years. Um, you know, could be two years, could be three years. And the SEC's deal is gonna be the same way. Uh, so we're going to, this is kind of a big step towards mega conferences. I still think we're gonna land on four, uh, but this is such a good deal, it's going to help everybody get better football and better quality football. It's going to hurt the small teams, you know, um, but, but it's going to help them as well. I mean, Rutgers and Maryland 
are probably the two teams that people make the biggest example of in the Big Ten as why were they even added. They just got paid, though. <laughs> they did. And this is why, you know, it was back in cable boxes. So this also comes in tune, which is funny, because this is a, you know, this is a, a deal of major networks. We haven't even talked about the Amazons and, and, and others jumping in here on the streaming level. But the, the national news yesterday was Wednesday. For the first time in the history of, of, of the world, streaming numbers outweighed cable numbers. Mm, yeah. So now we're going to head towards that as well. And that's going to be a bigger piece of the pie for everybody. And it's going to be more lucrative for everybody. And it's going to bring more. And it's going to help Notre Dame. You know, people say, oh, Notre Dame should join the conference. They don't need to. This is going to help them negotiate their deal. And I don't know the numbers. Like, I'm not a math guy. But, you know, I projected Notre Dame to sort of strike a $100 million deal um, based on what I was seeing from the Big Ten. And I think this kind of cements that, that their their bottom number is $100 million a year. And it's going to be from NBC. And everybody's saying, well, NBC's going in with this, you know, this Big Ten deal, and they're going to want to spend their money, this, that, and the other. NBC has endless amount of money. They're going to keep Notre Dame in the fold and Notre Dame is going to make a ton of money. And then we're going to see some really cool big 10 Notre Dame matchups, but we're also going to see some really cool Notre Dame ACC matchups. And if, if the big 10 decides, Hey, we're not going to play you Notre Dame unless you join us, then we're going to see some great Notre Dame versus SEC matchups because the SEC will never say that. SEC does, SEC doesn't want Notre Dame. They don't care. Uh, so it's good for everybody. It's going to make for better college football games, and it's going to make for more lucrative. Um, college football used to be, it was the NFL. I think it was NASCAR NFL college football as far as the three most lucrative place uh, uh, sports at ESPN. And the last time I looked at that was 10 years ago or so. But I, I think this cements college football as one of the big three forever. Well, you mentioned ESPN. You're you're in Connecticut, right? You're in their backyard. Mm-hmm. They don't have Big Ten football, right? At least not right now. They don't have Big Ten sports to show at all. What what does this mean for them? A and B. What do you think their next move is? I mean, let's not let's not sugarcoat this, Mike. ESPN for a long time has had a stranglehold on college football, right? Yeah. Now that's breaking up a little bit. What, what do you think they do next to respond, or do they just kind of tuck their tail between their legs and, and move on? I mean, they could make a pitch for Notre Dame. You know, there could be a bidding war there. Uh, I doubt it. Um, what they're going to, you know, sort of double down and have more slots available for other conferences, you know, and, and so that's going to help. The, it helps the Big 12, Pac-12. One of those won't survive, but whatever, whoever's left from that large conference, uh, you know, these two egomaniacs that are running both of these, like, oh, we're, we're you know, <laughs> what was it? Open for business. Open, open for business. And Read your you know, mark. Open for business. I mean, come on, you know, and, and then, and then the Pac-12 doubling down is like, uh, okay, yeah, whatever, you know, like these, this little childish stat between them, they're going to have to figure it out and get together. It's going to help the ACC because it's going to make their, their TV deal more lucrative with ESPN. What it's going to, what's going to suck is that we're not going to see game day at Columbus, you know, or, yeah. or, or Happy Valley or in Ann Arbor, because that's just out. It, it's bad business. Yeah. sense for for espn to send their game day crew to you know ohio state michigan anymore and that's going to be a big change for us because as long as game day has been around which is 20 plus years we're used to that balance and now espn is going to be more of a regional television network when it comes to college football which kind of sucks uh but espn will be fine they over invested in everything not just college football, but they, there was a time, I forget it was, maybe 15, 15, 20 years ago, where they just invested in everything, and it was all live sports. So they, they, they threw too much money at every entity known to man from the NHL to college football, and it just it bit them in the butt, and they can't afford it anymore. And you think of ESPN, they can afford anything? No. I mean, it's ABC, it's Disney, I get it, but ESPN – has sort of regressed as cable boxes are going away and, and other people have caught up. So the Apple TVs of the world, um, you know, the Amazons of the world are now going to become players in here. And you're going to see the market spread out more where it's not just going to be, you know, you could tune into ESPN from noon to two in the morning 
Um, you're going to be, you know, watching and streaming and doing all this sort of stuff, yeah. which I think is cool. It's going to be good for everybody, but it's not great for ESPN. What do you make really quickly? I don't know if you're following this closely, if you have any insight. Uh, the California Board of Regents are meeting and they're talking to UCLA and USC about leaving. And the, now there's some Twitter rumors. Can, can that be reversed? Can they bring UCLA back? You're shaking your head vehemently. No, for those watching on video, for those no. on audio, just trust me. No. It's definitely vehement. No. Anything no. going on there? No. I think it's a no. Okay. So, and here's why. If you think, if anybody thinks that these 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 companies are going to throw seven plus billion dollars at billion. the Big Ten, you know, with a B, without USC and UCLA, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You know, you could you could clamor all you want to get them back in the fold, but there's no way this deal would not be solidified and finalized without USC and UCLA because it's a whole huge huge market. Um, I mean, is it the number one market? I think. Right. Or number two, <laughs> yeah, New York probably. City, New York, LA. LA, yeah. I mean, there you go. So this deal would not be done if there was any, any chance of that at all. I mean, you know, companies are smart. They go to their legal eagles and they say, hey, is there any chance we could really get screwed on this uh, USC, UCLA? And the answer to that is after much research is like, no, never going to happen. Don't worry about it. Let them posture all they want. Let them border regions, whatever. I mean, border regions reeks of um people who think they're smarter than everybody else well they're not going to have any success whatsoever in pulling this deal back well it's also a face saving you know exercise right they have to act like oh we're not going to stand for this right we're not going to i mean you have to say face even to your point when you know there's no possible option you have to look like you you give a crap so that you don't feel like a powerless organization you're going to fight at least right and you know yeah. oh finally we're going to let them go but the reality is you never had a chance anyway but no offense to california it's typical california fighting it sounds like a fence to california but yes yeah, well right. it's it's yeah. kind of half ass a couple yeah. months later you know yeah. i mean if this was and, and again maybe it's east coast bias maybe it's just where i grew up or maybe it's just the fact that i've dealt with people out in california versus people in new york and there's a such a difference business-wise um it would be different if this was east coast um the the west coast sort of approach to it is, yeah, we're going to save face, but it's a half-assed effort and it's not going to really last for long. Uh, whereas there would be a death grip Kung Fu fight to the death if this was over the East Coast market. I might watch that. How much do you think that could get in a TV deal? I would love to see that. I would that absolutely is? love to see it. And, and you know what? I mean, it's so different. You, you walk into, I, I, I've, walked into the offices at you know, NBC and ESPN and, and Fox and all these over the years. And I worked for a company that was based out of the West Coast for years and years and years. And then we were bought by a company that was based out of the East Coast. And the difference is astonishing. It is absolutely astonishing. So the, the fight that they have out there, it's going to be half-assed. It's not going to work. USC and UCLA are gone. And I honestly think Oregon and Washington and Stanford and Cal will be – next and, and yeah, that's my next not, question you you, you mentioned tomorrow. expansion yeah yeah but the, but the next dominoes to, to fall will be those four schools i think and to the big 10 in your opinion mm -hmm. and i don't think the sec really cares they don't want those teams they don't care about a western footprint well, who, do, who, the do they, SEC, who do they want then well i mean they'd like to get some schools in the acc um, but but those the the grant or rights deal and all that they're not going to mess with that the sec doesn't need anybody you know they got texas and oklahoma that's as far west as they need to be um i think they could have gotten you to see in ucla to be honest with you <laughs> because they're the sec they can get anybody they want but i i think they're okay with it so i think when you see their deal yes there's going to be language in there that says you know if this happens then this happens an expansion but they're not actively seeking it as much as the big 10 and i think the big 10 needs to because we all know SEC football still rules the world. They still win every national championship. And when they don't win a national championship, it's, you know, a, a Clemson team, you know, or a Florida State team, which are Southeast based, or it's Ohio State once every decade. Um, so the SEC still rules. Greg Sankey's still like, eh, seven plus billion. Okay. You know, I got a year or a year and a half or whatever to figure out how to get 10 billion. 
<clears throat> easy no problem <laughs> do you ever see a scenario and this is just me asking funny stupid questions do you ever see relegation do you ever see a scenario where vanderbilt gets shown the door and sec tries to upgrade or do you think that those agreements are so locked in we're in an inclusionary society now <clears throat> I didn't get you the can't memo. pick on anybody you can't bully anybody you can't disparage okay. anybody you can't tell anybody that you know kids can't cross the street um there's no locked doors. I've been watching Stranger Things. Um, Stranger Things is set in the 80s, and it's just mm -hmm. funny to see the differences. You know, in the 80s, you would go up to your friend's house, and I, I grew up in the 80s, and say, you know, the parents would answer the door, is Jimmy here? Uh, I don't know. And they'd ask the other parent, is Jimmy here? No idea. Um, and now if you don't know where your kid is for two seconds, uh, it's a panic. You know, I used to walk to school, not uphill both ways in the snow, but I used to yeah. walk to school when I was six years old in first grade and it was a mile and a half. <clears throat> and there were no adults supervising us, just a bunch of kids, six years old, walking to school. If that happened now, there would be would be on milk cartons and, and you know, there'd be alerts. No, you cannot ever disclude anybody in this little mamby pamby world we live in. So Vanderbilt will continue to suck and they will continue to reap the benefits of being in this conference because they're not going to be kicked out. All right. Uh, one can dream. All right. Uh, speaking of kicked out, let's move to quarterback moves. A couple of schools made some moves this week or some decisions were made. Mike, LSU, Notre Dame, Virginia Tech among them. Let's start with LSU. Miles mm -hmm. Brennan, not no longer QB1, no longer playing football. That was an interesting uh, decision. What Take us behind the scenes there. What led to, to Miles Brennan walking away from football altogether? Well, I don't believe it's – permanent. I, I think he'll end up in the portal and I think he'll end up finding a home. Miles Brennan has had a very frustrating career. Um, you know, every time he was supposed to break through and be the guy, he got hurt or something occurred. Um, you know, he has shown talent. He's shown the ability uh, in games and then he gets injured and has a setback. So this was like the year, you know, Brian Kelly's coming in as a new coach. There's not a lot of competition there. You got younger guys like Nussmeyer and Howard, and then you got Jaden Daniels coming over. But there was a real thought that Miles could win the job, and he didn't. Um, he wasn't named QB1, and he decided to retire. Maybe he's had enough of the pounding. Maybe he's had enough of the injuries. Uh, but I still have a sneaking suspicion he'll end up in the portal and finish his career someplace. Um, but I, I think this is Brian Kelly, you know, not a quarterback whisperer by any means. That was one of the big criticisms at Notre Dame is that he didn't have a quarterback that, that could win games or bring you from behind. But I think this is Brian Kelly looking at what's been done and what hasn't worked. And what hasn't worked is Miles Brennan being named your starter. Um, sure. It just hasn't. And that doesn't mean Jaden Daniels is the solution because uh, I don't think he is. But maybe he wants to roll the dice with younger guys. The danger here is that Brian Kelly's got this you know, guaranteed contract for, you know, $100 million, $10 million a year or whatever. But it doesn't matter. If they go out in five and seven this season, everybody's going to be clamoring for his head. Um, That's it. Yeah, they're going to have to be, you know, they're going to want him gone. Um, that was the case, honestly, before the off-field scandal issues with Ed Orgeron. I mean, he won the national championship of 2019 with arguably perhaps what you could, you could make an argument saying the best team ever. One of the best team of all time, yeah. Right. And then the next year, people wanted him gone. And, and that was before the off-field stuff. So that's what Brian Kelly's in danger of. That's what everybody in the SEC, you know, short of Nick Saban's in danger of. And Kirby Smart, of course, is, is not included in that. So he has to win. Um, so there could be a temptation. Hey, let's make Miles Brennan our starter, and maybe we'll win seven games. And then we could, you know, sort of um, move into the next level with one of the younger guys. Uh, but... I think what he saw from Miles Brennan was not nearly enough for him to to take that step. And I think Brian Kelly's a very, very stubborn, hard headed person. You know, he's from my area. Um, we're just stubborn jerks. And I think he wants to do it his way. And Miles Brennan is not his way. His old school Notre Dame makes a decision at quarterback as well. What'd you make of uh, the announcement from uh, Marcus Freeman in year one on his starting quarterback? No surprise. The, 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 you know, Tyler Buckner was expected to be the guy. I think what we saw from Drew, Drew Pine wasn't, wasn't great. Um, 
certainly wasn't getting better. You know, the, the, the fear, of course, and the first thing you look for is when somebody's named the starter is that somebody else jumps in the portal. Um, you know, you just saw it at USF. Um, and, and UCF could be the benefit of that with McLean. Yeah. I don't know. We um, already are. Did it happen? Yeah. See, I can't keep up with this crap. When yeah. did that happen? I don't know if it's officially announced, but it hasn't been officially announced. I knew it's that happened. for a fact. Yes. And I he may or may 100%. not be on campus today. He may or may not have been a practice. Yeah. So here's the thing. So he, he comes out and announces, you know, what, one day after going on the portal, thank you to all the schools. <laughs> and of course, everybody knows he's going to UCF. And I, the reason I said may or may not, because it hasn't been officially announced yet. And it hasn't been confirmed to me in any way, shape or form. So I have to like, check for you. I have to say that. You know, Fair. but then I don't know if it's been announced, you know, maybe it has. Um, I was expecting thank you to everybody and then announcement because that's the way things work. So that'll be announced tomorrow. OK, or, or maybe later tonight. But you, you worry about that. Jerry Bohannon gets a starting job a couple days later. In this case, it was like, I think, a, a week or a couple of weeks later. So is Drew Pine going to jump in the portal? And what Notre Dame fans are afraid of, and they shouldn't be, but they will be. Is this Dracovic? Because they would really love to have Dracovic the last couple of years um, at quarterback because they feel that he didn't have time to develop at Notre Dame. So what does it mean? <clears throat> it means Buckner was expected to win the job. He's not a he's not a difference maker. He's not. I mean, honestly, the last difference maker quarterback to me was Brady Quinn. You know. Because you look at back and you go back to Klaus and, and everybody since then, and it's been nobody that's been really that guy that you could point to that could really win football games for you if everything else fails. Um, and Brady Quinn didn't have that much success, but the numbers he put up were just astonishingly good, if anybody really cares to look. Ian Book? But Buck, Buckner's not that guy. Ian Book. Just, you know, he's okay. He won. I'm not saying he's great, but he, well, he won. Well, he won, but then yeah. you, but then you knew when they went to the playoffs, if you fell down by two touchdowns, you have zero chance of winning. With, with Brady Quinn, at least you knew you had a chance to come back. He, he has an arm, golden arm, slinging the ball around, blah, blah, blah. You know, Tyler Buckner's the same guy, I think. It's just like he, he's not going to be a guy that scares you. And, and Notre Dame's going to have to do what they do, which is, and I know they didn't do this as much uh, over the last year or so, you know, because – but they're going to have to recruit big offensive linemen. They're going to have to play power football. They're going to lack in the skill positions. They're going to lack a quarterback. They're going to play good defense. They're going to perhaps win 10 games uh, each season. On a good season, win 11. On a great season, win 12. And then they're going to go off and get throttled by whoever in the playoff or in the national championship game like they've done in the past until they get a better quarterback. And Tyler Buckner is not that guy. So he's the guy who should have won the job. But he's not the guy that's going to change the fortune of Notre Dame. And then count me among the people in the world who forgot that Brent Pry was the head coach of Virginia Tech, who today named his starting quarterback not me. Uh, Grant Wells transfer from what Marshall, I think it is, right? So, what did yeah. you make of of, of that move uh, to to start Wells? I like Pry. I do because he's 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 he was there during Beamer Ball. And I think that's what they need to get back to. I mean, Justin Fuente was a hot name out of Memphis. They hired him. He's been, he was a disaster. You know, you look at the development of a head and hooker at, at Virginia tech versus what he's done at Tennessee last season. And you're just like everything at Virginia tech turned into a nightmare. Um, and now I think it's going to get back to not, not Beamer ball success. You know, I don't think they're going to play for a national championship. I don't think, you know, Michael Vick's out there anywhere uh, headed to Virginia Tech. In this day and age, with NIL, you know, uh, a Hampton Roads big-time quarterback might not go to Virginia Tech anymore. Um, but I do like Brent Pry because he's got that pedigree. And I like Wells. His dad is a Virginia Tech alum. You know, they grew up on Beamer Ball. Um He's got a lot of talent. He's got a strong arm. He's accurate. The problem is, is he's got that strong arm and he thinks he can do anything with it. He tries to fit the ball in there. 13 interceptions last season. That's not good. You got to cut down on the mistakes. But everybody I've talked to said that he's starting to get into a rhythm and more of a consistency. We saw it in the spring ball. Now we see it here. 
that he's going to cut down on those mistakes. So I think it's a good fit. Um, I think this is a kid that loves Virginia Tech and is going to give it their all. Um, he's not Hooker. He's not Burmeister. Um, he's going to be more successful than both of them at Virginia Tech. And he's going to put up good numbers. Um, and I think Pry in a couple of years is going to be a guy that has Virginia Tech fans at least happy again as to where they are and maybe forget a little bit of the fun day stuff. Yeah. What are the expectations uh, for the Hokies this year, in your opinion? Where do you, where do you, where do they need to be at in year one of the Brent Pryor? Uh, I mean, it's, 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 they aren't great. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're, bowl, they're bowl, in bowl eligible. Yeah. I mean, they have to be, I mean, in this day and age, you have to be bowl eligible. If you're not, you're, you're really in big trouble right out of the gate. Um, they're in a, conference that's not very good they're in a division that's not great i mean you know arguably the best team in their in their division in the coastal is miami or Pitt, and neither of those are world beaters unc took a step back georgia tech and duke are horrendous virginia who knows i mean they've got armstrong they've got the wide receivers um you know but there's a reason they have a new coach as well. So I think, you know, the expectation is, you know, a seven and five football season um, and then try to build from there. And when you look at the schedule, you know, it's Old Dominion, Boston College, Wofford, West Virginia, and then into the teeth of your ACC schedule. This isn't murderer's row. I mean, NC State at NC State is a difficult um, out of division football game, but if they don't win seven games with this schedule, then I think people are going to be upset. Notre Dame, we talked about them a second ago. Uh, recruiting news out of them, Keon Keeley says, no thanks, I'm going to take my talents elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Tuscaloosa, question mark. Uh, where, where are we at with Notre Dame recruiting? I know we had lauded them a few shows back on how well they had done out of the gate. They had you know, one of the best classes, at least early on. One decommit. I think you're hearing about some other names that are potentially at risk as well. Um, where's Notre Dame recruiting at? What's caused this shift here pretty quickly as we we haven't kicked off the season yet, Mike? And is it all? Did they all just not like the Manti Teo documentary? What do you think it was? <laughs> I haven't watched it yet. I oh, it's fantastic. It. I cannot it is, wait to watch it. I don't know what to think about. It was interesting. He, you know, you, you live it back in time and you think about all that stuff. But it's interesting. He, he, whatever you thought of Manti Teo, you were going to have a. a, a boatload of respect for him after he watched this. Yeah, and, and the Manti Teo recruitment was very, very interesting to follow um, because, you know, there were different times where it was definitely going to be... He talks US, about that in the doc. He talks about why USC. he picked Notre Dame. I don't know if you know the story okay. or if he's making this up. He talks about why he picked Notre Dame. Oh, no, I, I don't. I haven't seen any part of the documentary, but I remember covering the story and, and covering him very, very closely. And, you know, it was USC at one point, BYU at one point, he got in trouble on his BYU visit. Does he talk about that? No, uh, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it yet. You can hit pause really quickly here, Mike, you don't, I'm sure you'll figure this out in the doc. He says that he was going to USC. He had all but decided he was looking for a sign from, from above. He, mm -hmm. uh, he met some guy, a teacher or something in the classroom. They were talking and the guy said, you know what, man, I really thought you'd go someplace like Notre Dame and walked out of the room. And Manti said, that's my sign. And he signed with Notre Dame. He says he cried the entire time. He actually showed the video. He looked like he was crying while he was mm -hmm. signing his, uh, his letter of intent. So that's Maybe. apparently why BYU did not come up. Funny. Yeah. Well, you know, BYU is, there's different rules of, engagement at BYU when it comes to official visits and things like that. And, you know, he wasn't a BYU fit in that respect. Um, I'll just leave it at that. But BYU is very much uh, a possibility for him. USC was a lock in many people's eyes. He took his official visit to Notre Dame and it was snowing mm -hmm. and freezing. And everybody's like, no, there's no way this kid's going to go to Notre Dame, you know, from Hawaii to South Bend. And he ended up going there. And it was a very intriguing story. And it was very private and hush hush. A lot of the stuff that I found out was from sources and stuff because Manti didn't talk about it. Um, and it's not the Manti Te 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 documentary that has anything to do with recruiting. It's just we knew Keon Keeley was going to decommit. I mean, he was on campus at Tuscaloosa a couple weeks ago. Um, there was rumors of a flip immediately there. I talked to some sources that said he's not going to flip right away. You know, he's, he's going to take his time with this process. He's a very calculated kid. Um, he's not going to make an impetuous decision. And if he does decide he's going to back away from Notre Dame first, 
and then make his decision from there. So now you've got other programs, you know, Ohio State, Florida fans all think they've got a shot. It's going to Alabama. I mean, it's just done. I just don't know when he's going to say it out loud. Um, and they're going to lose Peyton Bowen. Uh, he's been sort of a silent commitment to Oklahoma, but Texas A&M is still in there for him. He's from Denton, Texas. You know, this is what happens when you win recruiting battles on the road sometimes. You know, Notre Dame's still got a top three class. When they lose Bowen, it'll probably slide to, to, to you know, top five status. Um, they'll be fine. Uh, but this is not a shocker whatsoever. And everybody says, oh, it's Notre Dame's, you know, NIL and all this other garbage. Yeah, kids have to make decisions based on different things nowadays, but everything doesn't always point to NIL. It just doesn't. When you go to Alabama on a visit, they don't beg you to come. They explain to you why you should. And that's more, I think, impactful than any sort of recruiting pitch. You know, this is a high academic kid. This is a very smart kid. This is a high character kid. All of those things play into Notre Dame and what they stand for and mean. Uh, but this is also not a dumb kid, you know, and this is a kid that sees, well, gee, you could be the next Will Anderson. And this is kind of how we've done producing, you know, Jack linebackers or edge guys or the defensive linemen or first rounders in general. Uh, these are the national title trophies over here. Take a look at them. You might want to win one of those <laughs> or maybe three of them. And that's life. I mean, just the way it is. Recruiting is recruiting. People say NIL. No, you lost to Nick Saban. Now, it's not official yet, I get. And maybe there's some twists and turns here where he doesn't end up in Alabama. But you lost to Nick Saban. That's not shameful. And it has nothing to do with NIL whatsoever. So Notre Dame fans will, and like every other fan base, they will immediately point to money. But this isn't a money decision. And honestly, it's I'm learning more and more these decisions are less about money because they're going to make money in South Bend. They're going to make money in Tuscaloosa. They're going to make money wherever they go. It's more about development for the NFL and becoming the best and, and winning this player you can become. Mm -hmm. um, people still don't believe me that Jordan Addison made his decision based on, not based on NIL when he went to USC. Um, he didn't. He wants to be the best he can possibly be. And he didn't really gel with the new coaches at Pitt. He lost his quarterback. He wanted the best situation for him. And USC, in his mind, was that. So, no, so sky's, sky's not falling if you're in South Bend. No, you're going to be okay. Fine. But here's the thing everybody craps on Brian Kelly because he couldn't put together top five recruiting classes. He said he was going to, but he never could. Marcus Freeman can't put together top five recruiting classes either. I'm sorry. Notre Dame's mm -hmm. going to finish probably outside the top five in every recruiting ranking you're going to see simply because if you take the top 300 players in the country, they got to throw 80 or 90 of them out the window, maybe 100, maybe 120, depending on the year, because they won't be able to get them in academically or feel comfortable enough to recruit them at that level because Notre Dame academics is here and most of the other schools, you know, short of the Northwesterns and Stanford's of the world are much, much lower. And I'm doing the height thing if Here's you're not the, watching. So that isn't Brian Kelly's fault. That's not Marcus Freeman's fault. The last time Notre Dame got a break academically, and people will disagree with this also because there's so many Notre Dame experts, fans out there who know everything about this, you know, program. The last time is Lou Holtz, and, and it's probably the last time ever. You know, unless they go rogue and Marcus Freeman doesn't work out and they hire Urban Meyer, you know, there will be promises made to a coach like that that says, hey, we're going to let you take whoever you want. But this is the team, this is the team that turned down Carson Palmer because he didn't have academics mm -hmm. 100 years ago. That's just the way Notre Dame is. So they're fine. Uh, the recruiting class is going to be fine. But – Let's stop with this. Brian Kelly couldn't recruit business because Freeman's probably going to end up right around the same area that Brian Kelly did. If you haven't been to MikeFarrellSports.com, you're missing out on good stuff, including Mike's official uh, oh. top 50 DL non-edge list. Mike, it doesn't get any sexier than top 50 DL non-edge. Non but here we are. 
Uh, you've got your your, your list out again, MikeFarrellSports.com or MFarrellSports on Twitter or Instagram. I know you have fun with, with a lot of these. I know we kind of poke fun at these a little bit, but a lot of research has to go into this one particularly, right? Because these guys maybe aren't getting the sack numbers. You know, sometimes they're, they're eating up double teams and other guys are are getting stats because of them. So walk me through the 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 hell you went through to put this thing together. It sucked. It sucked. It was difficult because, again, you know, who's an edge versus who's not an edge. And, you know, it just sucked. The edge was kind of easy. You know, I tried to avoid off the ball linebackers as much as possible. But if you actually, you know, rush the passer, you were in the edge group. Um, But it, it was difficult because you're talking about the big guys inside. You're also talking about the five guys. You have to, like, you have to be inclusive and, and look really hard at everything um, statistically if you want to have an accurate list. And, of course, people tear the list apart, and that's fine. I get it. Uh, but this was the toughest one. The edge was difficult. Uh, offensive line wasn't fun. But this was, this, was, this was the toughest and the least sexy, too, as you mentioned. I mean, offensive line, maybe the least sexy. Those big guys are sexy, Mike. What are you talking about? Uh, some of these guys are sexy, too. I mean, the non-edge guys. And I haven't written up the non-edge guys yet, like the biggest complaints and stuff like that. I did that for every position so far, and I'm going to do the non-edge guys, too. But there were less complaints about this overall than at least the edge guys and some others. So I'm happy about that, I guess. Uh, one thing I found surprising, the number one player was Jalen Carter from Georgia. And then 49 other names on this list, none other from Georgia. We've obviously thought of Georgia as a stout D-line the last couple of seasons. I know they lost a lot of talent to the NFL. Only one Georgia Bulldog represented here. Well, look at who they lost. <laughs> yeah, no, they're big names. No, that's uh, it's substantial. They lost a lot, yeah. I, so, I mean, they've got younger guys. You know, UC Clemson has two guys on the list. And, you know, this is just cyclical. I mean, Jordan Davis and, and Devontae Wyatt are both gone off to NFL riches and superstardom. And so you, you, you sort of regroup a little bit. They've got young talent there for sure. Just not enough guys that I think can move the needle to get in the top 50. And Jalen Carter is a lot of people think short of Will Anderson, he's the best non quarterback chance for anybody to go number one in the draft. He's that special. Uh, and he's that good. What, what I found kind of neat, I found it neat that Baylor, has two guys in the top. I was going to ask that. I, I needed to get my magnifying glass out. Those look like two BUs next to uh, number seven and number eight. Yeah, uh, that, that's a that's a pretty stout D line for a uh, for the Baylor team. No, some of these logos are really hard to compress. I don't do the graphic. My guy Aaron does them. Aaron, what's up, Aaron? Awesome. Aaron's great. Um, Aaron's a UConn student, just graduated, and he does a great job with these. But Oklahoma is a tough one because when you compress the Oklahoma, it looks like Indiana. And they have the same kind of colors, you know, in Baylor, there's really not a B anywhere in this uh, yeah. because the B is so big for Baylor. So um, the, the graphics are tough uh, and I, I shout out to him, but Baylor getting Jackson player from Tulsa, you know, and, and Siaka is awesome. That's a great one, two punch. And it's something that maybe people wouldn't know. So what I want, what I want here is the uneducated, uh, not uneducated, the, 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 the non-fervent, crazy <laughs> college football fans. To like common, the common fan, this. maybe? The common fan. Um, okay. I want them, I'm moving it over so I can see it a little bit better. I want them to see this and say, oh, this is kind of neat. Look at it. You know, I mean, Baylor's got two of the best interior defensive linemen in the country. I didn't know that. Um, and I also want them to look at this and say, oh, look. This kid's a transfer. You know, Akeem Mesador was at West Virginia. Wow, they would have had Dante Sills and Mesador, who would have been both top 15 guys. And then some of the, the players, like Richard Gibbonor is not really a non-edge, but he is. There is a tough one because he's not, he's not your typical linebacker. He's not your typical edge. Um, and he makes a ton of plays against the run, but he doesn't have the size of some of these other guys. Tyler Batty, nobody knows. Nobody knows him. BYU. That was the fun part, and it's the fun part about putting these lists together is is how important some of these guys are. If you ask Penn State fans last year where the defense sort of fell off, it's when Mustafer got hurt. Um, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it, 
you ask Pitt fans, you know, who's your best defensive player last year? And some people are going to answer, you know, Kalaja Kansi. Uh, but, but these are guys that a lot of people would never have heard of in their lives. So that's why I like doing it. And I will tell you this, when it comes to like social media engagement and traffic and all this other stuff, these are just gold. They just blow up. Um, the problem with them is not compiling them. I mean, it takes a lot of research and I'm working on linebackers now. Um, it's, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of, it's a lot of film. It's a lot of, you know, talking to people and coaches and, Hey, we got this guy at our school is going to blow up and he's going to be great. Blah, blah, blah. Keep an eye on him. He's been, he's been great in fall camp and he was, you know, awesome in the spring. It's also, you know, very time consuming to, to put together these graphics and Aaron does a great job of it, but I, you know, listen, he's an intern. He, I can't have him working 24 hours a day for me. So I flipped him the LB list. That'll be up this week and we'll talk about it next week. Uh, and that's a fun one too. Uh, a really, really interesting one because, you know, where does a Justin flow fit after two years of being injured? Who's number one? Is it Noah Sewell? Is it Trenton Simpson? Is it Jack Campbell at Iowa? Um, all this stuff I love. I, I live for these type of lists. I wish this is all I had to write and I could make millions because it's the most fun for me. All I want you to do, Mike, is pronounce the name of number 37 on your mm -hmm. list. Uh, looks like a kid from Northwestern. If you can go ahead and give me that nope. name, that'd be great. No, nope. Hold on. Oh, yeah. That's easy. Add it to Mima. I just screwed it up. All right. No, it's <laughs> Addo to Miwa. Uh, added to Wari. So what he I, said. I've well, I've worked on that before, um, and I clearly. just screwed it up. I just <laughs> yeah, screwed it up. But every time I work on it, I screw up these, some of these names. Um, the edge was was awesome because there were a couple hyphenated names in there that were also very difficult. And listen, it took me, I don't know, about five years to get Jadevion right hmm. instead of Jadevion. Uh, and and it, and then he never corrected me, and no one ever corrected me. And that might not even be right. Um, kids, that's the funny part about them. When you talk to them in high school, they'll never correct you if their name is pronounced wrong. Um, when we started covering Uangalele, it was Wagalele. We would call him DJ Wagalele. Hmm. And he would never say boo about it. And it wasn't even close. Uh, TJ, I mean, not TJ, uh, Tua Tongavailoa, when we first started pronouncing his name, we had it way off and he wouldn't, he wouldn't correct us. So that's another problem, but yeah, Felix Enedike Uzoma from, uh, from Kansas state. It's actually is Uzoma, but it, some people say Uzoma. Um, and then Zion to Pola the two at Washington were difficult. And that one, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't even look at and pronounce, maybe pronounce. That's why, that's why I'm here, Mike. All right. We start off the show. You were pissed off. We're going to end the show soon. Now. Are you pissed off at anything else now? Have you, have you gotten better. the package yet? Any update on the package? No, delivery? no. I got to call him back. He won't freaking text me. Trust. I will tell you this, though. I was on a radio show. I was on Full Ride on Sirius XM 84 yesterday. Oh, shameless my plug. Buddy, my buddy, uh, he convinced me to do fantasy football again this year. Oh, and okay. I, well, I retired last year. After I didn't see the announcement. No, I apologize. No, I didn't see the, the ceremony. I never win. And yeah. all my guys get hurt. And and all my guys always instantly get hurt. So whoever I draft, I mean, I know more about football than anybody else in the league, but I never win and I never come close to winning. And I always have bad luck. Um, so I said last year, screw it. I'm done. I'm tired of this. But he convinced me to come back in. And then what does he do? He puts me in a group chat, a text, group text with 20 with 11 other people, the 12 person okay. lead. Sure. And we're, and they're all trying to come up with a schedule for their day. You know, where we can have this stupid draft and I'm on the radio and I'm hearing ding, 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 like maybe 25 dings. And I was pissed and I got off the radio show because I was on wow. zoom like this. And then I just immediately left the conversation. Wow. Do not put someone in a group chat with, idiots and people who can't figure out their freaking schedule. I can't do September 2nd. I'm waxing my wife's legs that day, or I gotta, I gotta take my mother-in-law for a stroll or whatever stupid excuse you have. It's <laughs> fantasy football. It's dumb. We're going to a bar. We're going to have beer and we're going to draft players, you know, 
you don't have to make it the end of the world. Call in sick if you have to, leave work early, stub your toe. But the excuses I saw, hey buddy, really upset me. So that's, that's a dog, by the way. He's not talking to me. That was a dog. No, that's my that's my boy. Um, but that was yesterday. I'm not pissed about that today. But again, you know, you can put example. your you can put your phone on silent. You know, right? I don't. He loves to okay. talk. Hey, buddy. Hi. No, you no, you can well, not your dog. You can put your phone on silent. No, you're on the radio. I might, well, I can't, if I'm on there for like we're on this for an hour, right? Yeah. If yes. I'm on there for 45 minutes, I could miss something really good. Like the UCF transfer quarterback. That could come through a text message. I could get a text from Gus. Any minute now. Any minute now. But when I look and it's not a text from Gus and it's, you know, 12 idiots trying to figure out what day they can have a fantasy football draft because they've all got stupid, lame excuses because their lives are ridiculous. That pisses me off. Two questions. Do you get, you get texts from Gus often? Does he text you Never. on his, his quarterback yeah. situation? Okay, I just want the, the I, joke. I, I, I I'm going to need a forward on those if you, if you got no, those. No, and two, no. for a long time, I tried to work on a Chris Childers impression. I can never really pull it off, though. I used to listen to Full awesome. Ride all the time, and, and you don't uh, he's anymore? got such a unique voice. Uh, I don't, I'm not in the car as much as it used to be, so it used to be a yeah. daily commute thing. He's got such a unique voice. I used to try to do the Chris Childers, but I can't pull it off anymore. Well, I worked with Chris back at the beginning when he started his radio career at Rivals. We had Rivals Radio. Because back in the days before we were sold to a massive conglomerate that ruined the company, um, we, were, <laughs> we were mobile. You know, We were flexible, and we were... A, a cell phone company so we could do whatever we wanted. So we popped up, you know, our own video and we popped up our own rivals radio station and he was the guy. Um, and I think he worked with Bill King who still does radio in Nashville. Uh, and Chris was, he wasn't great. He wasn't great. So the fact that he's, you know, blossomed into this career and he's one of the funniest guys you're ever going to meet. And the best part of Full, full Ride that I do every week is, is the commercial break. We get two hour, uh, two minutes and 50 seconds. And we're on there talking about the dumbest stuff. And Rick Neuheisel is like just crawling out of his skin because we're talking about idiotic, you know, boy stuff. Um, Chris Childers is awesome. But yeah, he's got a deep voice. Uh, I don't think anybody imitates him, though. It's deep, but then it's not, though. Chris Child, like he's got like this thing. I he can't does. really. Yeah. I used to. No, that's pretty yeah. good. Actually. It's deep, but all of a sudden it comes out like really high pitched at times, and it's. He also it has is. a tendency to ask a long question, you know, like you're like, yeah. So on the second down, I was drinking milk. By the way, milk does body good. You should have that on Tuesdays. But anyway, I want and I'm like, where was the? I, I missed the question. But I love Chris. By the way, I've never met him. He doesn't know me, so I probably shouldn't make fun he of him. He does. But, uh, he does. He did that actually this week. He did that this week. He was yeah. going around, around, around on the question, and then. I actually got hung up on or something, and then he had to re-ask. <laughs> I don't think questions. it was an accident, Mike. <laughs> well, not an accident, yeah. And then I come back on, and he's like, "Let me ask you a question." It took him two seconds to ask the question, like he just asked yeah. the question, you know. But before it's like a minute build up, and he's talking yes. about this other stuff, and but that's part of the fun of it, and and the fact that him and New Heisel are such completely different human beings. Opposite the show pony, yeah. It's so great. It's it's a great dynamic, and I'm more Chris Childers than I'm New Heisel by far. So the two of us, when we get together, I call us, you know, that movie Step Brothers. That's us. Mm. We're just two idiots. And and Rick's just like, he doesn't even know what to do. Not arguing so. that. Uh, awesome. my, two media, my two media pet peeves, the long-winded question, and then the talk about question. Coach, talk about your defense. What, was that? What's, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean talk? Yeah, they were there. I saw them. Play, like, I don't, those right. are my two, my two media pet peeves. Talk about something. Talk well, about your quarterback. Your talk, he has arms. obviously, Thanks. open-ended questions are the best. Sure. You know, so that's a very, very open ended question. But I don't know. I, I, I just feel in the media, it's difficult because you, you have to ask a question that, you know, the coach hates and, you know, he's going to be like, it's a yeah. stupid question and, you know, his answer is going to suck. But then if you don't ask it, people get upset with you. Like, why didn't you ask him about this? Like, you know, like, OK, UCF, Scott yeah. Frost was probably asked about the Nebraska job at the end of that season. Every day. 50,000 times. Every day. Right. And if you're the reporter that doesn't ask him about it, then you suck at your job. But if you're the reporter that does ask him about it, he's going to give you the typical answer. I'm focused on UCF. This is our team. Blah, 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 blah. This the week. Yeah. Complete yeah. garbage. So it's a no. Well, you just dis you disarm that now. You go, coach, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you. Right. And then you yeah, ask the question. Sure, That's the new sure. move when you have to but ask the question. Right. And I get. But what's the point? I mean, you're never going to get a good answer. And if you do get an answer, if you get a real honest answer. I forget what coach it was recently. 
Well, you're, it's Cal all about Perry, you're trying to probably you're, you're trying you know? to catch them all in the Nick Saban. I'm not going to be the Alabama head coach. So then you have that soundbite forever of him saying, mm-hmm. "I'm not going to be the Alabama head coach." I think that's the deal, and most. The local media guys, I think, get it because you don't want to piss off the coach because that's your lifeline access, right? So you're gonna you're gonna tiptoe around that stuff at times. The national guys, you want that. I'm not gonna be the Alabama head coach, and then you can just play that thing in a loop forever. Yeah. So uh, the other part of that is, you know, you may get a great soundbite. I don't know what questions were asked to Calipari that made him come out and say we're a basketball school and that his, you know, his, his indoor facility smelled like piss or whatever he said. But you you may get that. But then the coach is never going to do that again. I mean, it, it was a one-off and he's not going to, now he's going to give you just boring answers to everything you say. Uh, he's going to do a March on Lynch. I'm just here because that's, you know, I'm paid to do it or I don't want to be fine. don't get fined. Or, yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. So it, honesty is not rewarded in this world. I mean, I'm honest about things. I, I tell my opinion about things and, you know, I've been, people try to cancel me all the time just because I say what I think. You know, like, okay, Oklahoma fan, stop being a big baby. How about Lincoln Riley? He was a great coach. He went to the playoff three out of five years. Guess what? Brent Venable is not going to go to the playoff three out of five years. That's not going to happen. Guess what? Marcus Freeman's not going to play for the national championship and go to the playoff two years. It's not going to happen. Oh, you suck. You... So what do you want me to say? You want me to say that Marcus Freeman is going to win seven national titles and, and Oklahoma is going to, you know, create a Nick Saban dynasty? I mean, Honest opinions aren't they're 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 intriguing, but they're not welcome. And I feel bad for media people in this world because they have to ask the questions that they know they're going to get crappy answers to. All right. Well, I'm not Chris Childers, but we are going to we're going to end this thing, Mike. We appreciate everyone Long, for tuning man. in. Make sure One hour uh, and eleven minutes. Yeah. Make sure you subscribe on the Believe Podcast Network wherever you get your downloadable content. You can find this fine program YouTube channel, Mike. Let's plug that YouTube channel. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. That way, anytime Mike decides to go live or do anything, you're going to be the first to know about it. That's inside info. Uh, Mike Farrell YouTube page. Make sure you subscribe to that. Bookmark that. Make it your homepage. Make it your screensaver. Whatever you're into, go ahead and make that thing a reality. And uh, make sure you support what Mike's doing at MikeFarrellSports.com. He's building something. Uh, If you like his work, you want to support that. So make sure you support him so he can keep doing this stuff for you. Mike. Yeah. I'm, I'm ex- um, I need a bang, I need a bang energy drink at this point. I'm exhausted. Well, we're gonna, yeah, we got a couple of exciting announcements too, and, and they're in the, the the works as far as you know, a platform we're moving to, and some other sponsorship deals and things like that. And the YouTube channel, those shorts you did, which I'll bother you about again, they really work. I mean, they really did. This time, I actually wrote down notes of stuff you said. So wow. <laughs> usually, I just half listen to you, but this time, I actually took some notes. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> that's good. But I mean, we really got a lot of subscribers from it, so I think that's going to be the key. And it's all you doing the work. But it was. It's a good thing you're getting compensated really well. It's a, it's a great thing. Mike's going to give me one of those free cases of Bang Energy. So I'm going to go <laughs> down one of those bad boys. Yep. We're going to be good fired luck. up for next time. So make sure you uh, you follow along. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. College football almost here, and we will take you all the way there. Mike, enjoy whatever it is you're about to drink. Thanks.